Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Jackson Crawford. During a long career of teaching Norse literature and language at several different universities, I often told my students, I repeatedly, over years told my students, the Norse have a really weird attitude toward knowing the future. It is awesome and a mark of your incredible wisdom if you can do it accidentally without trying. But if you try, you're at minimum a weirdo and probably a foreigner if you're a woman, and you're a pervert and among the worst people living if you're a man. <laughs> However, I have often reflected, especially in the last year as so many strange news events have, have kind of come together at once that no one really could have predicted, that we still have fundamentally much the same attitude toward knowing the future. So in this video, what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about what this attitude is in Old Norse literature, and then a little bit uncharacteristically for this channel, how I think that sheds light on our own current attitudes today. Let's start out by taking a look at the saga character Njol. When we first meet him, which of course is in like chapter 20 of Njol's saga, he's introduced to us with some comments about his appearance and his personality, and we are told that he is vitter och forsbar, wise and foresighted. Now, these two things very frequently go together. In fact, the word wise in Old Norse, which actually the several words that kind of have roughly the same meaning, fitter, vis, uh, being foremost among them. One of the, the really core concepts of being wise in Old Norse literature is that you can see the future, but it's more or less accidentally. The people who are wise and forspar, right, fitter, wise and, and foresighted, are the people who can maybe see in incredible detail what's coming but they're not doing it by looking at a crystal ball or by casting spells or by casting lots or something like that. They're doing it more or less automatically just by the process of being so smart, right? They're so smart, they almost pierce the veil of the future. So for example, with Njol, and there's, and there's many examples in the saga of this, he is ludicrously, specifically foresighted. So when his friend and distant relative Gunnar comes to him and says that, he wants to bring a case against uh, this individual, uh, Ruter, who owes uh, his cousin Unner some money because they had a divorce and the settlement was never made. It's a long story. You can listen to it in my videos about Njol Saga. He asks uh, Njol for a plan about how to do this, and Njol walks him through every minute of his interactions with Ruter that are going to come, right? He predicts every single word Ruter is going to say, every reaction he's going to have to everything that he tells Gunnar to say. It's just ludicrously specific. And then, of course, when it happens, it all goes exactly as Njol foresaw that it would. So Njol gets to sit back and be, uh, you know, smug about how well he can see the future, no doubt. This happens time and again in Njol's saga, and Njol is merely one of the best examples of this ludicrously foresighted individual. Of course, Njol has many characteristics that we associate with wisdom even today. We often want our wise people to be kind of old, right? We don't, uh, you know, shake the shoulder of the 18-year-old with earbuds in front of us on the bus and ask him for wisdom, right? We turn instead to the creased faces, you know, the, the, the frosty brows when we want to know uh, how to live wisely. And Njol is an older man, so he fits that figure pretty well. And it's noticeable that we have much the same association of wisdom and age with foresightedness as the Norse do. Just look at those damn ads that come up at every website, no matter what ad blocker you might have, you're going to see some of these, where you have some often kind of scary looking older guy, like older middle-aged guy, often with a white beard, right, which I guess is sort of signaling age and, and wisdom maybe. He often has very serious eyes. I think they often do that as kind of as some Photoshop trick they do with the eyes there. And they'll tell you, you know, this guy who predicted whatever uh, now predicts whatever. And, you know, 
if you pay him the right amount, you can get his secrets. Or, you know, so-and-so thinks CBD, what, I, I don't know what CBD is, but apparently some guy like this thinks that it's dangerous for you and he's going to tell you, and I'm sure you have to pay someone to, to find out what the secrets are. You know, we, we, regardless of whether these guys really foresaw whatever they claim to have foreseen, we seem to be easily taken in by confident claims that people did, right? I mean, I could tell you right now, I foresaw coronavirus. I foresaw the results of the 2020 election. I foresaw, you know, this, that, and the other that happened in, in the last year. And maybe if I uh, was the right kind of I don't know, these guru guys that seem to haunt the internet and I knew how to shout at you the right way and, and, and probably if I had a you know, beard down to my chest, you might believe me and maybe even my insane predictions for the next year you, you might take seriously. What surprises me is that we often take these profit guys seriously even when they fail, as they inevitably do, because no one can really predict everything. Okay, that aside, it's interesting to note that there's such a completely awful evaluation in the Old Norse sources for men, especially men, who try to see the future, right? So when in Inglinga Saga, a lesser known work of Snorri, as part of his lesser known Heimskringla, when Snorri is describing in Inglinga Saga the magic known to the god Odin, he spends quite a bit of time talking about all the different magic things he knows how to do. He knows how to find metals in the earth. He knows how to calm a fire or calm a storm. He knows how to wake up the dead and talk to them. He knows how to teach ravens how to speak, that sort of thing. But he uses the special term, not the sort of neutral magic terms like galdar and fjolkengi, but the special term seidar to describe a type of magic that allows Odin to see the future. And it's noticeable that when human beings and gods who are male are said to practice Sather, that that is that's perverted, right? It's Argar, right? A word that has very heavy connotations about sexual, um, sexually inappropriate, especially homosexual activity, and then has a lot of the sort of locker room associations with homosexuality like uh, cowardice and, and physical weakness. So in the poem Lokasena, when um, Loki is insulting all the various gods, he's very careful to point out that Odin committed Seidr and that this was Arger of him in response to something that Odin has accused him of doing, which was Arger. And we see constantly in, uh, for example, the saga of Gisli, where there is a, uh, a male practitioner of Seidr, a guy named Thorgrimer, knows um, that he is said to practice this with Ergi, Ergi being the noun form of Arger, it's like Argerness. So it's, it's, it's amazing, kind of, when you consider that someone like Njal is able to see the future so clearly and specifically and well, and he's wise and awesome and, and praised for it. But these guys and gods who practice the magical art of trying to see the future are doing something so wrong and bad and base. But is that so different from the way that we talk about this stuff today? Let me give you a quick word from my sponsor and then I'll tell you why I think that it really is fundamentally the same attitude that prevails today. We just don't think about it very consciously. It's really tempting to look back at the past, knowing what was coming after something else, and say, didn't they see that coming? Right? It's very tempting for us today to look at the end of World War I and say, yeah, I can see where World War II is going to start from this. Or to look at the end of World War II and say, yeah, I can see where the Cold War is coming from this. And no doubt some people did broadly kind of foresee things like World War II and the Cold War. I doubt that anybody that specifically foresaw all the details of either of those conflicts. But, in fact, if you were an average person in, say, 1918, 
I doubt that you could have foreseen particularly well what 1942 would be like. But for the people that did kind of broadly foresee those trends, we can look back and say, you know, almost unwittingly, wow, that's a smart, wise person, right? We tend to kind of invest um, a lot of intelligence points in people who can even broadly and wide strokes see the future, even when it's more or less a dice toss. What's interesting to me, too, is that we often invest morality points in the people who can see the future, right? I think that what you could broadly call fundamental belief systems, and this isn't just religion, you know, there's a very, there's a fundamentalist version of communism. There's a fundamentalist version of, of, of I guess, what you could broadly call like MAGAism, right? There's a fundamental version of any belief system, even what you could call scientism, right? I think that fundamental strains of belief, the strains of belief that say, you know, we have kind of figured everything out, our theory explains everything, and, um, and people who diverge from our theory either haven't heard it or there's something wrong with them. I think these belief systems tend to invest a certain amount of morality in uh, seeing the future. Uh, let me explain what I mean. There's this sense that like, okay, from a fundamental Christian perspective perhaps, that someone who was enduring the flames of hell ought to have been wise enough to foresee that that was the consequences of their actions, right? Or from perhaps like a fundamental Marxist understanding, someone who is, uh, who is you know, refused to participate in, in the proletarian struggle or whatever, um, has who's who's living at, you know at the bottom rung of some society well he ought to have foreseen that not participating in, in revolution would would put him where he's at but we say ah you know this person foresaw the flames of hell and decided to embrace christ or this person foresaw you know the failure the bourgeoisie or whatever and, and embraced revolution the, those fundamental systems invest wisdom in people who correctly, quote unquote, foresaw the future on consequences of their, their actions. Whereas again, there's actually not that much uh, that you can objectively look at that, you know, suggests that there's a, such a thing as, as the flames of hell or, you know, communist utopia or whatever. Okay, I think the Norse more or less do the same thing, right? Where there's a sense that the person who is wise also has a certain amount of morality and acting in accordance with his predictions about the future. I'm reminded that among the three Norns, the female beings who determine the courses of our lives, the one who broadly can be identified with the future, her name is Skuld, which is the exact same word as English should. There's a sense of ought, of indebtedness about what's coming in the future, of inevitability. And I think that that actually strongly binds together the pre-Christian Norse with the people of today, right? Even though from this point where I stand right now on this day in January 2021, I could get in my truck and drive north, drive east, drive west, drive south. I could never go back to my current residence. I could leave Colorado and never come back. These things aren't particularly likely. Um, I could keep going west and never go east again, right? There's all kinds of various, possibly insane decisions that I could make from this point, none of which you could actually have predicted from um, my current vantage point or the current, or the course of my life up to this point, right? Or, or, or perhaps something even as insane as like in my next video, I'll appear in a baseball cap, right? You could never have predicted that from the course of my previous videos, but in retrospect, it would have been quote unquote inevitable. I think that regardless of our belief system, we are tempted to see inevitability both in the present vis-a-vis -vis the past and in the future vis-a-vis -vis the present. And to invest undeserved wisdom and morality in the people who more or less by chance predict the future. Consider how much credit we give to the people, and I mean, you know, sometimes literally credit, but how much how much we invest, and again, sometimes literally invest, in people who call the stock market right, 
you know, as random as that can be. Do you think in 1997, somebody who'd bought a bunch of Amazon stock for however cheap it was then really knew that he was going to be a millionaire now? I, it's, it's just, it's, it's ludicrous to think that anybody actually predicts the future that clearly. You can make better and worse predictions, but so much of it is dice. Okay, here is something that I think we can take from Norse literature in dealing with this temptation that we still have today about investing too much wisdom and morality in seeing the future. There are different strains of wisdom in Norse literature, just like there's different strains of wisdom today, right? Not every person living today has the same definition of wisdom or morality, and neither did every person in the pre-Christian Norse world. And I think that characters like Njol are kind of a more conventional Norse type than the deeper wisdom that I think you can find in some of the Eddic poems. And I want to specifically, of course, as always, single out Havamal. But also there's a good stanza from the poem For Skirnes, spoken by Skirnir, the messenger of the god Freyr, when he says in stanza 13, Einu dögri mer var alder um skapaler, och alt liv um laget. On one day, my lifespan was shaped for me and all my life made. This sense that yes, it's inevitable, but as he says, there's always a better option than to weep for the man who is eager to go forward. A sense that yes, there's inevitability, but, there's def but in the defiance of inevitability and the not caring about inevitability, that's where good character is found. And I think that that's actually a really good explanation of what's going on in the Volsung's legends, where Sigurdr actually knows, or has heard anyway, basically how his entire life is going to go, right? In the poem Gripispa, he visits his uncle Gripir, who is foresighted, and Gripir tells him everything. Who's going to betray him? How he's going to die? Every little detail like that. Sigurdr has heard in advance. But when he has killed the dragon Falvnir and is talking to Falvnir, he tells him that, well, there is the one day, the Ein Dagr, kind of echoing the, the, the Eit Dagr in uh, Forskirnes. There is one day when he will die, he will rule his wealth until that day, right? It's, it's accepting there's an inevitable fate and just saying, well, in the meantime, I am going to do what I have to do. And Havamal, of course, is full of stances with much the same import, right? Do, do not put too much faith too early in your son or in a field that you've sown, because weather rules the field and whim rules the sun. Neither one is going to do what you expect, right? Havamal is really an and to me, this is a much deeper wisdom that we often don't appreciate. A, a poem that rejects a lot of the sort of supernatural elements that are sometimes there in the sagas. and says, you cannot tell what's coming. I think that my favorite stanza um, along these lines is actually 40, where Odin says, Do not be so sparing in using your money that you don't use it for your own needs. Often what you say for your children will end up in the hands of your enemies. Many things will go worse than you expect. And in Old Norse, that's Fjör sins er fengit hever skulit madr thorv thola. Oft sparir leithum that hever ljuvum hugat bart gengr ver en varu. And that reminds me also of Ecclesiastes 9.11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Right, you can find a lot of different perspectives on the world in the Bible. You can find a lot of different perspectives on the world in Old Norse literature. But there are strains, Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, Havamal in the Poetic Edda, and peppered elsewhere throughout those works too, where a, I think, more mature and maturely resigned, but not 
the fetist strain of wisdom comes in that says actually the average person trying to make money from predicting the future whether that's on predict it or the stock market is going to do no better than chance so i'm not going to try i'm going to let the dice roll and i am going to enjoy the days that i've got when i've got them and let the profits have their futures and i will have my present okay that got a little bit toward a rant perhaps um, because i really do think that we do try too hard to think about the future we do try too hard to predict it and we do invest too much faith and credit in the people who say that they can none of us can and hall them all reminds us very well how to live with that uncertainty for now from beautiful colorado let me wish you all the best